The country of Korea was coming out from under 40 years of control by Imperial Japan and was being split apart between communist forces in the north and nationalist forces in the south. The nation was split in half at the 38th parallel. In the south, the U.S. maintained a small number of military advisors. The Soviets dominated the northern half, which was filled with communist Korean soldiers who had just helped Mao Zedong's forces take control of China. On June 25, 1950, North Korea, with Soviet and Chinese approval, invaded South Korea. The U.S. convinced the U.N. Security Council to establish a United Nations Command, or UNC, to defend South Korea under the leadership of the U.S. and General Douglas MacArthur. General MacArthur planned a bold and brilliant amphibious assault at Incheon to take back the South. Incheon was the port for Seoul, 18 miles inland, and was the closest possible landing site to the capital, and the communication center was there. The history of war proves that nine out of 10 times an army has been destroyed because its supply lines have been cut off. We shall land at Incheon and I shall crush them. The Joint Chiefs in Washington were doubtful of his plan, but MacArthur's gamble paid off. The daring assault was a tremendous success. By September 23rd, North Korea was in retreat from the Pusan perimeter. And on September 29th, 1950, MacArthur reported, By the grace of a merciful providence, our forces fighting under the standard of that greatest hope and inspiration of mankind, the United Nations, have liberated this ancient city of Seoul. The Incheon offensive succeeded in driving the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. But in late November, attacks by all Chinese forces hammered units of the United Nations Command. The Soviets provided air support for any battles in communist territory and UNC forces in North Korea began to fold and MacArthur ordered a withdrawal. In late December, a new commander under MacArthur took over the battered 8th Army, General Matthew Ridgway. He restored confidence in his troops, pushing officers to the front lines and out of the rear command posts. Under Ridgway, the 8th Army inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy and recaptured Seoul in March 1951. When MacArthur was relieved of command by Truman in April, Ridgway was promoted to full general and took command of the UN forces. In August 1953, with hostilities in Korea ended, Ridgway became the Army Chief of Staff under President Eisenhower. In that role, he was asked to give Eisenhower an assessment of what would be required for U.S. military involvement in Vietnam. Ridgway's conclusion was that a massive commitment would be required to achieve the nation's goals in Vietnam. Massive enough that Eisenhower determined not to intervene. In fact, during the 1950s, military expansion, due to the Cold War, was focused on air power and nuclear superiority to the point that conventional forces began to suffer from outdated equipment and reduced budgets. But advances in the tools of conventional warfare did not halt. The M60 battle tank, with its 105 millimeter gun, became operational in 1960. The Army also expanded its use of helicopters, which had already proved their value in Korea and would again in Vietnam. And the Army also took advantage of the improvements in communications technology and, eventually, computers. Those technological changes were coming as part of the space race. And the Army had a role here, too. Several of the earliest astronauts were graduates of the United States Military Academy at West Point, including Frank Borman, the first man to orbit the moon, Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, and Edward White, the first American to perform a spacewalk. But as defense expenditures in the 1960s rose, policymakers looked for places to cut.
Defense Secretary Robert McNamara sought to reduce the size of the reserve forces, which seemed more expensive than their value. There was resistance in Congress and elsewhere, but eventually, in 1967, a compromise was reached that achieved most of what McNamara wanted. The reserves retained their support and training units, but lost all but three combat brigades, bringing their overall size down to 260,000. The National Guard remained at 400,000 men. To augment the regular forces in Vietnam, as it had in World Wars I and II and Korea, the U.S. relied on the Selective Service Draft. The first major conflict of the Vietnam War was the Battle of Yad Drang, beginning with the battle at Landing Zone X-Ray. In the week before Thanksgiving in 1965, the U.S. Army came head to head with the North Vietnamese Army for the first time. It was a battle that would lead to three separate Medals of Honor. North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, regiments had attempted the destruction of a U.S. Special Forces camp and the 1st Cavalry Division was pursuing them. On November 14, 1965, this pursuit led the 7th Cavalry Regiment's 1st Battalion to the Ya Drang Valley on a search and destroy mission. Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore entered the valley first with members of his Bravo Company. Sixteen helicopters shuttled Bravo Company into landing zone X-ray on the northeast side of Chu Pong Mountain. They would secure the landing zone and await the battalion's Alpha, Charlie, and Delta companies. From the air, LZ X-ray looked flat and open. On the ground, it was a different matter. The landing zone was covered with elephant grass up to five feet high perfect for hiding enemy soldiers. Enormous anthills dotted the area, large enough to provide cover for weapons units. Colonel Moore knew that the enemy had forces in this area. What he didn't know was that three regiments of the NVA were gathered nearby. Far more soldiers than the one company he had managed to bring in so far. The Americans received an alert to the size of the forces they would be facing when Bravo's first platoon ah. discovered an unarmed NVA deserter. When questioned, he reported that there were three NVA battalions on Chu Pong Mountain, and they were anxious to kill American soldiers. As Bravo Company intensified their search for enemy units, Alpha Company, including Alpha's 2nd platoon leader, Lieutenant Joe Marm, landed and secured the landing zone. Bravo Company's first platoon was hit by an enemy force of about equal size a little after noon. Flanked on both sides, the platoon radioed for help. Colonel Moore's battalion was being hit hard all over LZ X-ray. The fifth airlift of the day, carrying the last of Charlie Company and the lead elements of Delta was only able to land half of its helicopters. Mortar, rocket, and machine gun fire were so intense that Colonel Moore radioed the remaining eight choppers not to land. They suffered attacks throughout the night, but units from the 1st and 2nd Battalions would reach them the following day. In Vietnam, the Army and its commanding general, William Westmoreland, were forced to fight under strict limitations. They did not have the authority to strike at enemy bases in Laos or Cambodia or enter North Vietnam. Westmoreland believed that the U.S. could wear the North Vietnamese down through attrition, using the Army's superior firepower and mobility to ensure that the heaviest losses fell on the enemy. At the end of 1967, it seemed that he might be right. The momentum of the war seemed to be favoring the U.S. But the Tet Offensive, beginning on January 30th, 1968, changed the public's attitude towards the war. Tactically, the U.S. and South Vietnamese forces defeated the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese attackers.
But the political impact was devastating. The public had been led to believe that the communist enemy was incapable of an attack like the massive, widespread, organized Tet Offensive. They reacted with shock and distrust, unwilling to believe that the assault had truly been a defeat for the enemy. Public support for the war continued to drop. Westmoreland was replaced by General Creighton Abrams as commander in Vietnam, but then served as Army Chief of Staff until 1972. Though the war dragged on, that support never returned. When the Army left Vietnam in the 1970s, it was at a low point. Racial tensions, heroin addiction, and the desperate desire to not be the last man to die in Vietnam had all dealt the military a harsh blow. Discipline was terrible. Morale was worse. The end of the war did not mean the end of problems, but eliminating the draft and establishing an all-volunteer army would prove an important step in the right direction. An all-volunteer force would be better paid and better treated, while soldiers in an army with the unlimited manpower provided by the draft might be given menial, non-military duties that could sap morale, a smaller, better paid force could not afford to waste its highly trained fighting men. This meant fewer soldiers, to be sure. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.